Matthew chapter number 7, we're going to read through verse 6, chapter 7 verses 1 through 6. I, I know that many of our Bibles have a paragraph marker at verse 6, but I, after some study and thought, I, I believe 6 works with the other. I think it's correctly as, uh, set apart as a paragraph. That's not a problem. But I do believe as far as context is concerned, it applies to the thoughts that are developed in verses 1 through 5. So we will read our 1 through 6. So we will read uh, uh, Matthew chapter number 7, verses 1 through 6. Here we go. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Father, help me now under the anointing and empowering of your Holy Spirit to do that which only you can do. In fact, we trust you will do it indeed, that you, as, your, as our chief shepherd you will feed your flock, that you will speak to every heart as that heart has need, that you will take this passage, Lord, and and, and lay it down in the heart of each one that's here, including me. And I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Judging righteous judgment. Let's define our terms as we get into the passage. And, of course, the key word here is the word judge. And that word translates a Greek word, krenethi, in case you cared. And anyway, the interesting thing about it is that it's a, it's a plural term, and what you get out of that is to bring to the text to help give more force and power to what we're reading here in our mind and heart is the fact that it's talking about uh, uh, an imperative uh, uh, de- declaration of judgments. An imperative declaration of judgments. And so don't be one of those who go about judging others who have not first judged yourself. The word is translated in various ways in our Bible, and I believe the best way to get an idea of the depth of a Greek word is to find out the various ways it's it's translated in our King James Bible. It's been said often, and I think uh, for good reason and with merit, that the King James Bible is the best tutor to the Greek language you can find anywhere, and it really is. So as you go through your concordance, you find the various different ways that this particular word is translated in your Bible. You get a kind of rounded out idea of the full meaning of the term, the various ways that it's used. It's translated condemned or condemn in John chapter 3, 17 to 18. A couple of times there, the same word translated condemn. And then it's also translated determined. In Acts chapter 3, 13 and 20, verse 16, same word translated here, determined. And then in Acts chapter 15, verse number 19, it's translated sentence, as in proclaiming a sentence or proclaiming a, well, a judgment. In Acts 16, 4, the word uh, is translated ordained, and that is to choose and set apart and to make one, you know, set apart from another and so on. And 1 Corinthians 7, verse 37, the word decreed is used. And in a decree and in an ordination, choices are being made, judgments are being made, and so on. So you see how it all comes together. Acts 21, verse 25, uh, has the word concluded. The word concluded translates this word. Of course, the reason the various English words are used in these different places is because of a special ending or a prefix, or, you know, there are different reasons that they have these different English words. But nevertheless, you can see an interrelationship between these variations that help us get a rounded idea of what it means when Jesus says, judge not, lest you be judged. Um, concluded, and oh, excuse me, here's the next one. Acts 23, verse number 3, to be called in question. To be called in question is the idea. Romans chapter 14, verse 5, esteemeth. Well, when you esteem something, you out of an array, you pick this or that and esteem it above the others and whatever. So you esteem. 
uh, something, and that's a, it's a practice, or that's a, an act of judgment, if you will. And then 1 Corinthians 6, verse 6 translates the term, go to law, to be taken to law, or to go to law with a brother, as the context of 1 Corinthians 6, 6, condemning that practice. And then 2 Thessalonians 2, verse number 12, it, it translates it this way, that they might be damned. That they might be damned. That's a strong word, and it's included in the meaning of this word judge that we find in Revelation, uh, in Matthew uh, 7, verse 1, and in Revelation 18, verse 20, we see the word translated avenged. Avenged. So, avenged and damned, and go to law and esteem, and to be called in question, to conclude, to sentence someone, to determine this or that, and to condemn are all inside of this word judge. And so when Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged, it would comprehend all of these ideas in one measure or another. The idea is that we should not judge lest we be judged. Now it does not mean we're not to judge. The world has about five or six Bible verses that it really likes. This is one of them. Matthew 7, verse 1. They don't bother reading the rest of it, nor do they pick up some other verses that would help round out the meaning of this verse, but they like verse 1 of Matthew 7. Judge not, lest you be judged. Well, I'm going to, you know, kind of rain on their parade a little bit here. Because we're going to give you the context in which it's said and show you in the broader context of the rest of the Scripture. You know, it's like Jesus said to the devil who used a piece of the Bible to try to tempt him. He said, uh, it is written, Satan said, and he quoted a verse, and Jesus said, yeah, but it's also written, and he quoted another verse back to him. So Satan picked up a verse from here, but Jesus reached over and grabbed a verse from here. And so we're going to be doing that tonight with this passage and help you understand rightly what Jesus is and is not saying in Matthew 7, verse number 1. It doesn't mean we're never to judge. Rather, it means that we are to be careful in making judgments. We are to understand that when we make judgments of others, we open ourselves up to being judged likewise. And of course, we've all experienced this. There probably isn't anyone here who doesn't have some memory of a time when you brought something to the attention of another, where it provoked them to come back with about five things about you that they needed to bring to your attention. All right? I mean, I won't ask for a show of hands because maybe I am the only one that's happened to. But when you say, uh, well, let me talk to you about this, and then you lay something out that is judgmental, then they come back, well, well, what about you? And boom, 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 boom. They only have more than one, usually. You know, I'll give you a couple. And you wonder, have they been thinking of this for a while? You know, did they sit and make this list and are just waiting for the opportunity to spring it on you? Well, as principal of Baptist Christian School some years ago, it was necessary sometimes, of course, to call staff people in and have conversations with them that were not always real comfortable and, uh, but it never failed that if I said, well, you know, we're going to talk about this, they had a, two or three things that they wanted to bring to my attention. Well, you need to be prepared for that. If you're going to judge, you're going to be judged. All right? Judge not, lest you be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. What you dish out will be dished back. Is there anything at all in your own life worthy of judgment? If there is, be ready to have it brought up when you judge someone else. Just get ready for that. And so, second, the injunction is not against judging. It's against self-righteous judging, or it's against judging without first judging yourself. That's actually what he's talking about. I'll prove it to you some more as we move along, but... Clearly, the point that Jesus is making here is not that we're never supposed to judge. As a matter of fact, open your Bible to John chapter 7, verse 24. The Gospel of John chapter 7 and verse number 24. In fact, John 7, verse 24 ought to be written in the margin of your Bible next to Matthew 6 or 7, verse 1. Matthew 7, verse 1. Right there in the margin of your Bible, right? John 7, 24. Because if the world, the devil, takes Matthew 7, 1 and throws it at you, judge not, lest you be judged. You can reach over to the John 7, 24, 
and say, yeah, but the scripture also says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So the Bible says, judge righteous judgment. Or in other words, to give it context, judge not according to appearance. But if you're going to judge, you must judge righteously or judge righteous judgment. In fact, the context reads like this, beginning at verse 21 in the Gospel of John chapter 7. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and you marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So their judgment was superficial. It was based on something that just sort of lay on the surface. A real, a real uh, basic. The law says don't work on the Sabbath. Uh, you're uh, healing somebody. You're doing a work on the Sabbath. And so you are therefore condemned. You are therefore sentenced. You are therefore, we decree you therefore I go back and get all those words and throw them at Jesus because uh, he did a bad thing by doing a work on the Sabbath day. But Jesus turned it around on them and he said, hey, you guys circumcise on the Sabbath day. And you do that in order that the law of Moses might be fulfilled, might, that it might not be ignored. Now, what I've done is I've made a man every whit whole. You're, you're cutting a guy. I'm healing a guy. I mean, basically, you know, you're, you're circumcising someone and I'm healing someone. And you're judging me according to the appearance, or that is according to, as it were, the letter of the law. Now, this is an interesting connection I want to make here with this. That's why I'm spending a little time right on, right on this point. Jesus would equate this business of judging somebody on the letter of law as judging someone on the basis of appearances. You and I probably would not normally think that a judgment on, on appearances would be related to the kind of judgment he's rebuking with that statement. The kind of judgment he's rebuking with that statement is this, this uh, superficial application of the letter of law. Because Moses' law does say you don't do any work on the Sabbath day. I mean, that language is in there. Any work. Technically, you could say what Jesus did was a work. In fact, he said it. He said, I do one work in front of you and you all marvel. He, it's interesting. He said he didn't make any bones about it. He said, yep, did a work. You got that right. I did a work. So he didn't, even, he didn't even deny the charges. He said, yep, I did a work. And what I did, by contrast to what you allow, what I did as a work, by contrast to what you allow, what work you do allow for the special circumstance that it's in fulfillment of Moses' law to make sure you know, a child had to be circumcised on the eighth day. So if a, if a baby's eighth day landed on the Sabbath day, Letter of law. They're in a conundrum. Oh no, what are we going to do? We have a crisis. We're not supposed to work, but we're supposed to circumcise. Letter of the law is killing us here. Letter of the law says eighth day, but letter of the law says you can't do it on the Sabbath. What are we going to do? Well, they resolve to go ahead and go letter of law. See, on one side, but... Relax, letter of law on the other. And you see why he's rebuking them? They were willing to relax letter of law rules in their own judgment based on the idea that, well, it's more important to take care of the circumcision than it is to take care of the Sabbath. And Jesus says, it's more important for me to heal a man that needs healing right now than it is to worry about a Sabbath law. You think your work is so important, you could, you could lay aside the Sabbath law 
for your work. Well, I've come to heal and to help and so on. And, and yet you would judge me. You see where it's going? You understand how that goes? You dig underneath this thing. It's interesting that Jesus Christ would consider those who, who impose upon others letter of law type judgment are possibly, well, almost all, we put it to you this way, you will almost always find yourself vulnerable to this kind of rebuke. Because the letter of law is always a dangerous thing. The letter killeth, the Bible says. The Spirit giveth life. So Jesus Christ would consider this an appearance level type judgment. Judge not according to the appearance. It might look to you like I'm disregarding the Sabbath, but in truth, I'm not disregarding the Sabbath at all. And of course, we can bring a lot more scripture into this because the Sabbath wasn't made, or man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man and the needs and concerns of the man trump the issues and concerns of the Sabbath. That's what Jesus would say. Judge not according to appearance. Stop and look a little deeper here before we start applying letter of law judgments upon our brothers and sisters. And then look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 2. Let's take a look at that real quick. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 2. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 2, we have another verse that tells us we're supposed to judge. Oh no, what are we going to do? Jesus said, judge not. Let's get letter of law here. Judge not. Jesus said, judge not. But then he said, judge. Oh no. You get, you get my point where I'm going with this? We got letter of, of law conundrums. What are we going to do? We're stuck between these two verses. One says, don't judge. The other says, judge. Ah! <laughs> Relax. Go deeper. Don't stop at the superficial appearance of the whole thing. Look a little deeper. Obviously. He's saying something else. He's not saying never judge. He's saying something else. What is he saying? We're going to go for it in a minute. But look at 1 Corinthians 6 verse number 2. It says, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Uh-oh, we're in some serious trouble then. Maybe he's going to lift the ban on judge not then. Okay, we we'll say, well, he's going to lift the ban on judging at that time. Well, what about the rest of this then? And if the world shall be judged by you... Are ye unworthy to judge? Present tense, the smallest matters. <laughs> what? Judge not. Now look. Judge not. Flat statement. Just don't do it. Don't play games with me and say, well, he doesn't mean, you know, all judgment in this particular case. He means you judge within the church and matters that are brought before the church like Matthew 18. Yeah, of course you take care of that. No, no, no. He said don't judge. You get where I'm going? You understand what I'm saying here? Be careful about that spirit. Watch out for that spirit. That letter of the law kind of thing. Step back. Look at the bigger picture. See beyond the appearances. See beyond the superficial. Be guided by the scripture by all means. But understand that when he said, judge not, there's, it's coupled with another phrase, lest ye be judged. See? There's not a period after judge not. Period. Of course, even if there was, we have these other verses to contend with that would come back and cause us to kind of get a more rounded idea of it, but there is no period after the, the phrase judge not. And then, of course, James uh, warned us about becoming judges of evil thoughts. In James chapter 2, we want to read that passage together. Go ahead and open your Bible to James chapter 2. James chapter number 2, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come in unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. <laughs> well, anyway, no comment on that for the moment. And say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. 
Are you not then, of, then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? Now, this, this phrase, judges of evil thoughts, does not mean a person who judges the thoughts of others as evil or someone who says, here's this thought and here's this thought and here's this thought and I consider this one and that one evil. He's not judging the thoughts. He's saying a person who exercises judgment with evil thoughts. That's what he's saying. Judges of evil thoughts in this phrase Ology, if you will, uh, suggests the idea to our mind, somebody who has an evil in their mind and heart judging others. So that's the idea of being a judge of an evil thought in this particular context. And you can put it together with the context, you can see that, it's real plain. It's a case where somebody comes in and they look a certain way and you judge them accordingly. Uh, this guy looks, uh, uh, he looks gay, so we decide that The gay clothing, by the way, uh, is not referencing, you know, the way they dress in San Francisco. <laughs> All right. It's using the expression in its older meaning and in its more true meaning. In fact, the homosexual community has greatly abused that good word. So gay clothing here is just talking about somebody who's got some, you know, they, they shop at, uh, I don't know, what's a real fancy clothing place as opposed to, say, a not-so-fancy clothing place. i got to be careful here. I don't want to offend anybody. Help me out. Is there, is there some place that really, if you go there, you've bought some real high-end stuff? Name a store. I want you to be the one people are mad at. Okay, May, okay. we'll take Macy's as the high-end store. Okay, now, what store would you pick around town that would be a low-end store? Walmart. Okay, very good. So, somebody walks in all decked out in Macy's, and you go, whoa, hey, now there's somebody that's of substance and of real value. Boy, we sure hope they join the church. And then somebody walks in and they're obviously they've been shopping at Walmart. Although I got to tell you, one of my favorite shirts that I own right now, I bought at Walmart. And I really like those George pants. So I don't know what I've just said about me. Maybe you don't want me to join the church. Too bad I'm already a member, but anyway. <laughs> but somebody comes in from, from Walmart, you know, dressed obviously at Walmart, or, or a, um, one of these, um, what do you call those things? You go in there and people give away their stuff and you go buy it? A thrift store, yeah. I'm a, I don't know what to pick on Walmart. I like Walmart's clothing. So a thrift store, all right? So Macy's and a thrift store. So somebody comes in, obviously they've shopped at um, the, the Goodwill over here. And then somebody else comes in and they've obviously shopped at Macy's. I mean, you can even, they've even got the tag showing so you can see. Yeah. And, uh, and then you give all kinds of deferential treatment to the person who's dressed in the gay clothing. And you kind of ignore or scorn or spurn the, the fellow that looks like he just climbed up out of the dumpster or something and walked into the church. Now, I've really gotten down there, haven't I? Uh, <laughs> but obviously... That's a judgment according to appearance. And you could say, well, yeah, but uh, that's a pretty obvious appearance situation. Now, all you can judge by the appearance there is that one guy shops at Macy's and the other guy, you know, he's really bad on his luck or whatever's going down for him, and he's, uh, he's not dressed so gaily. Right? That's all you can judge. Am I right? That's all you can ascertain. You could ascertain, well, that guy's dressed real fine. He's probably doing well. Everything's going okay for him, either that or, or he's, you know, a shyster and he's trying to pull something. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then somebody else, you look at But you shouldn't be bothering yourself with all that anyway, right? What should you be looking at? Look at the soul and, look, and be concerned about the person, the individual. I mean, the fact is that a person can walk in dressed in the gay clothing and be more miserable than the person who walks in, you know, dressed from Goodwill. The guy that walks in dressed from Macy's, he might be somebody that's just had a divorce and a major heartbreak in his life. Who knows? Right? You don't know. So you cannot judge according to appearances. You must judge instead righteous judgment, which, of course, is making judgments based on appearances. In James chapter 2. 
And so my point now is the instruction we're getting in Matthew 7 is not don't judge. The instruction we're getting, ironically, is actually the other side. How to do it right. Ironically, the verse that begins, judge not lest you be judged, and he goes on, is not saying don't judge, but rather giving us instruction how rightly to judge. We've been told to judge righteous judgment. We've been told, judge uh, according to what's righteous and not according to appearances. We've been told that we're to judge the smallest matters of the church. And so clearly Jesus is not contradicting all else he said on this topic. If you look at the passage carefully and don't go all letter of the law on it, but we'll relax and back up and take a look at the passage and bring together the other verses we've talked about, you begin to go, oh, and you see a little past the appearances and you begin to see, whoa, wow, so far from saying don't judge, this passage is giving us instruction how to do it right. So we have in the passage instruction for judging righteous judgment. Let's get that instruction. First, to judge righteous judgment you need to be ready to be judged. Judge not lest ye be judged. And so the instruction one is, before you enter into judging somebody else, stop and judge yourself first. In fact, that's the main point of the passage. Jesus labors on that point more than any other and severely rebukes those of us who forget that injunction who would judge someone else before we've judged ourselves. He says, you hypocrite, you get the beam out of your own eye before you go picking motes out of your brother's eye. So he lays heavy on that point. So the first point and the most important point to get is this. You're going to have to sometimes exercise judgment. You're going to be in a position where that's necessary. When you do it, when you get ready to do it, Stop and do your own first. Stop and look in the mirror first. Always examine your own life before you go about examining the life of someone else. And that's verses 1 and 2. And then the second thing with this in view, you judge yourself first and you keep in mind, as I mentioned, that this is very important to Christ. And it's, it, not only is it important to Christ, it should be important to you because here's a biblical principle. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 31 says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If you will judge yourself first, then you allay the deserved and necessary judgment that would come upon you. It's going to apply in a lot of ways. I guess in one way you could do it. If you have a glaring inconsistency in your own life in a certain area, it's not a bad idea to own that. I mean, you're in a position where you have to say something to the person about the situation. You just have to because either it's your job or you just have a moral, ethical responsibility to step in on something you see someone doing wrong. And yet, you know, you have a weakness in that area of your own. And so you might start by saying, you know what? I have this problem too. I fail in this area myself. And I see you doing that as well. And I'm concerned for you as I'm concerned for myself. Let's work on this thing together, right? That would be one way to apply this, judging yourself as before you go and judge somebody else. Now, don't be phony about it. I mean, it's easy to say, and I don't, this is not necessarily being phony, but it's easy to say, look, we all have failings. That's too generic. If you're going to point out a few failings in somebody else, go ahead and point out a few of your own. You're obligated, I think, to do it if your failings are in the same area. In other words, if you're picking motes out of somebody's eye when you've got a beam in your own eye in the same area, it would really be a good idea to take care of your beam and just be honest about it and come out front, all right? I mean, imagine me talking to somebody about, well, you know, something like, uh, well, but, well, speeding. You know, they, 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 the, uh, the Lord has been so gracious to me. 
I don't even know if you guys know this or not, if I should tell you guys, I don't want everyone to know it. I got stopped oh, a year or two ago, and, and the guy said, you were going such and such a speed, and we had a conversation about that, and he said, isn't 10 miles uh, enough for you? 10 miles of forgiveness, uh, leeway enough for you? I said, 10 miles? I thought it was five. He said, no, no, it's 10 miles. We'll, we'll cut you 10 miles an hour slack. I said, thank you. This is worth the price of the ticket. Man, so now I haven't had a ticket since. 10 miles works for me. I can usually keep it within 10 miles without any problem. I think God just had mercy on me. And he put it on the heart of all the policemen all over the country. No, I'm kidding. But anyway, yeah, I have a little bit of a Jehu characteristic in my personality, you know. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. They always knew when Jehu was coming because he drove furiously. That's the way he drove. There are about three or four of you who will not even drive with me. Especially to the mountains. So I have a bad reputation with regard to that. I've got what you might call a beam in my own eye in that regard. And it wouldn't be very effective for me to try to talk to you about your speeding habits. But if I was going to talk to you about your speeding habits, I might start by saying, I got my own, and guess what? We get 10 miles. <laughs> Stay within 10, you're going to be okay. Uh, probably not the best illustration to use, but I thought maybe it would be helpful somewhat. I mean, right? Right, George? I wouldn't be somebody that could... Nobody's going to call me to do a seminar on driving safely and, and within the speed limit. <laughs> they might call me to attend such a meeting, but they're not going to call me to speak at that meeting. And so I have an area in, in my life that's, that's a problem in that, in that. And you know what? You too, probably in some areas, have issues like that. And if you're going to address the problem in someone else's life you're probably going to need to get ready for whatever the problem is in your life to be brought up. Judge not, lest ye be judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye will also be judged. It's a very good principle, and yet that doesn't mean you can't use that to just say, I don't have to judge. I have no responsibility to judge in that area because I have a weakness in the area of myself. No. Now you have a double responsibility. Judge yourself and then talk to your friend. And maybe you should recruit your friend to help you and make yourself available to help your friend. Amen? Amen. All right, third thing to keep in mind. Be mindful of who you are judging. The last verse I believe in this passage, verse number six, I believe applies to what he's talking about in verses one through five. When you're going to judge someone, or you feel you're responsible to say something, to offer some discriminating um, observations on some, their behavior or something. I mean, you have a responsibility to do it, let's just say, you do. It's a hard, I don't take the time right now to, I mean, a parent to a child, this would apply. It applies to an employer with an employee. It applies to a pastor, of course, when he's reproving or rebuking and exhorting all well, along suffering, he needs to keep in mind, as the old preachers often said, you know, when I put my finger at you, I got three pointing back at me, right? How many of you have heard preachers say that? You've never heard me say it. Because I don't believe that. They all point at you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding around. No, indeed, it always, anything I say to you is applicable to me first, and, and almost always, and I'm, I'm just, just only because uh, I'm, I'm mindful of the possibility that uh, I missed on this sometime in my 40 some odd years of preaching. I'm going to offer a little caveat here, but I, don't, I can't think of a time when I preached something where I didn't work myself over with the sermon before I let you have it. I always do that. I always go through a message and preach it to me before I preach it to the church. Now let's go on to the next thing. Be mindful then of who you are judging. If they are dogs and swine or are swine, then you might want to just 
you know, appreciate the benefit you receive from your own self-judgment and yet not pass on the pearls you've pulled out of the oyster in your own self-judgment. Or the holy truth you might have culled from Scripture or in communion with God that helped you, you might decide it's not appropriate to put this holy truth before this dog or to take this pearl of wisdom that you uncovered from your own heart in much prayer, perhaps even fasting and soul searching and you found this pearl of wisdom in that exercise and it might not be something you want to put in front of a pig, a swine. Open your Bible to Second Peter Chapter 2, verse 22. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 22, the Bible says, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now the context of this passage is, is worthy of, of some some observation, some note here. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. <laughs> I guess you could pick it up from verse 7. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. I wonder if he would qualify as one of these dogs or swine. A fellow who was washed, but then, you know, dove in there <clears throat> in uh, Sodom and got filthy with the pigs dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vex his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not rarely an accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots are they, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Now this sounds rather judgmental, don't you think? As you're anyway, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worth, worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. How about that? Well, I won't have the time. I was intending to go through this and exegete it more carefully. I don't think I need to, though. I think it speaks for itself as you read through it. And basically, the argument... The statement is this, that you've got these people who were once washed and who were clean and who were escaped from the pollutions of the world, people who were 
given much grace from God and shown much light on the way they should go. And then, however, they did despite the grace of God, as Hebrews warns us, and they went ahead and rejected all those favors and forgetting that they were washed from their sins. They turn like a pig does who's just been washed and they jump right back in the muck and mire, uh, the filthy muck and mire of their pig pen. And like the dog, and we've seen dogs do this. I don't know if you have, but I have more than once seen dogs turn around and, and start licking up their own vomit. It's a very disconcerting thing to see. Ugh. Disgusting. And yet when God looks at Christians, his own people, who have been washed, who have been delivered, who have clean, escaped the pollutions of the world, who were put upon the rock of his good name and given the fortress of his name in which to hide, who have been assured they would never be tempted above that they are able, but would with every temptation also be given a way to escape. He who has conferred upon these such favor and such blessedness as to open their eyes to see truth and to turn their heart to the way of righteousness and to call them by His Spirit to the right and good way. For people like that to turn and go back into their old ways is likened appropriately to the dog that regurgitates and then eats it or the pig that has just been washed and jumps back into the mire. That's the way God sees it. And he says something interesting in this passage. He says, it would have been better for them. How can that be? How could it, how could the Spirit say that? I mean, at least they're not going to go to hell. And I'm going to go to something here that's very important and it's something of a segue in the message, but it comes back around to the point. Now watch. It would have been better for them they had not known the way, then that they should know the way and then turn out of the way back into the old way. And we would reason, how can that be? How could, how could it be better? Because the end of them would have been hellfire, where at least now the end of them will be, will be heaven. And you see, that's just the way we think. And that's a problem. We think like that. We think like, well, at least I'm going to go to heaven. Well, I know I'm going to heaven. Well, I know I'm saved. Licking the vomit. How many of them are out there like that? They're licking their vomit and saying, well, I, but I know I'm saved. They're wallowing in the mire. And if you say something to them, they look at you and go, I'm going to heaven. You know, from the Lord's point of view, that person's worse off than the individual who, who was not saved but is stuck in the mire. In other words, you got two pigs there. One of them is a saved pig and one's a lost pig. And God looks at him and says, you're more disgusting to me and you're worse off than that fellow right there. He's got two dogs in front of him, both of them licking their vomit, but one of them's a saved dog and the other's a lost dog. And God looks at those two dogs and he says, I despise that one far more than I do that one. I'm disgusted with that one far more than I'm disgusted with this one. That's my own kid behaving like that. That's my own child doing that. Interesting, isn't it? It's funny how we tend to think things from our point of view and not from God's point of view. That is, we have judgment that's kind of like on the appearance level and not on, on the deeper level to really understand. I'm not suggesting that God's going to take his own child who's licking vomit and swimming in mire and throw them into hell. But, I mean, you can look at this and just see it without me laboring on it too much. You can 
probably even relate to it in some degree or measure. If your own kid's behaving like that, it hurts you more than when some other lost person's behaving like that, right? Hurts you more. Take it more personal, don't you? It's a deeper offense. It's a greater offense. It has in store for Christians who, who live like that, who behave that way. I'm not sure. I don't know exactly how that's going to work out. I, I read some passages that give me a pretty good idea, though, that it's not going to be what so many imagine. I know this for sure, for example, that the judgment seat of Christ is not going to be a picnic. All right? It's not going to be a picnic. It's not going to be high-fiving. Yo, we made it. All right. Paul said, when he described the judgment seat of Christ, he said in the very next verse, verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I mean, in the Gospels too, Jesus Christ talked about what he's going to do when he meets his servants. He's going to call his servants together. And he's going to judge them. He's going to say, um, it's get real time, folks. Now, I'm not quoting him. I'm just making the point here. It's get real time. So, yeah, you made it. Now, come here. Those of you who disobeyed me knowingly, you're really going to get it. You're going to be beaten with many stripes. Those of you who disobeyed me and you didn't know it, you're going to get beaten with a few stripes. Now, you've got to be sitting there thinking, whoa, 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 time out. You mean if I didn't know, I'm still in trouble? Yeah, because you should have known. You got a Bible. Why don't you read it? You got a church down the street. Why don't you go? Of course, I'm fussing at you, and here you are. And I imagine the group that's sitting here right now also reads their Bible, but I'm, I'm preaching right now, so let me preach. You got a Bible, read it. You got a church, go to it. Amen. You have a pastor, ask him. Amen. You should have known. You should have known. See, we just kind of leave it at a, at a superficial level and, and we don't even look at our brothers and sisters who are the vomit lickers and the, and the mire swimmers. Um, we don't even look at them the way we should. We should see them as worse off than if they had never been saved. I know from our perspective it's hard to not go... Yeah, but you know, at the end of the day, hell fires like a long time and real hot. I get that. But you're not thinking, when God says to that crowd, depart from me, you cursed lake of everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. What does he think when he looks back at the crowd that were the vomit lickers and the, and the, and the muck swimmers who are his own? See, my point here is that's what Peter's doing in this passage. He is just laying it on him, man. Vroom, vroom, and he's setting that plow deep, and he's, he's just really, boom, just, you know, as we used to say, ripping their face off and then putting it back on them or rearranging their face or something. I mean, you know, Peter's really, he's preaching here. And he's really letting them have it. And he's coming at this whole thing from a perspective that we don't stop and think about very often. So in this judge not lest you be judged fashion, while I'm pointing my finger at you with three back at me, while we're considering this whole thing of judge not lest you, not, lest you, you, know, lest you be judged, I have an exhortation from the Lord to reprove and to rebuke and to exhort with all long suffering. And so I repute, reprove you and rebuke you and exhort you. Don't lick your vomit. Don't get in the muck yourself. Because I have a suspicion that the Holy Spirit doesn't put his pearls before swine. 
I have a suspicion that the Holy Spirit doesn't do that. Consequently, if you're in church and the preaching's going on, or if you are reading your Bible and whatever, but you're a vomit licker and a muck swimmer, you're probably not getting much out of it. Probably don't get a whole lot out of church. If you do get a lot out of church, if you do get a lot out of reading your scriptures, if you do have that communion with the Holy Ghost where the Lord is sharing pearls with you, don't take it for granted. Rejoice. Rejoice. Amen. Amen. If you come to church and you go home with a pearl, boy, treasure that pearl. Because it just might mean you're not a dog. <laughs> and you're not a pig. Because you got washed. And you're not looking for the next opportunity to jump back in. Let's stand together, please.